I've just gone 10 o'clock, so I think I'll make a start if that's okay with everybody. I've just got a preliminary issue to deal with first. Following yesterday's council meeting and the setting of the budget, I have intimated my resignation. Uh, so it's really up to yourselves today whether you want me to continue or whether you want to uh, do the, the chair for on a pro tem basis. Sorry, <laughs> I'm happy for you to continue, Ellie, if you're okay. As I say, that. yeah, my resignation will be formally made today. It's whether everybody else is happy with that. I'm uh, happy to vacate the chair today. I'll take silence as an acquiescence, right? I'll carry on then. Uh, and just Willie. Katie, sorry. Willie, can I come in? in sorry, in I've got... No, no, you... Sorry, Katie. Ah, right. I don't know. You're fine. Maybe Claire can maybe pass over if I'm if hands are up. It's just really to, to pass on. I've absolutely no problem with yourself staying in the chair, but it's just to really pass to the committee that, like yourself, following the meeting yesterday, I too have also resigned from my position as vice chair of the of the area committee. So it's just to put that on record. So and just to say thank you to Jamie and Claire and the other officers for the support in my role as vice chair. Thank you. I'll continue and I'll keep the, the, the thanks to the end of the meeting then. Uh, right, I'll just say welcome everybody to, to the meeting. It is being live stream, uh, so it is. So we'll follow the usual practice in terms of anybody wants to speak, they'll intimate on the chat and I'll try and follow it from two sides here. Uh, so uh, apologies if I don't bring you in at a time when you should, but I'll try and keep an eye on it. Uh, that's all the protocol standing orders will uh, prevail uh, during this meeting. Uh, again, the, the, the protocol, if you leave, would you intimate on the chat? Uh, so that that's all. We'll deal now with the sedent and apologists. No apologists from... No, sorry, there is. Claire. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Chair, we've got three members present on Teams this morning, being councillors Dash Burgess, and Hagman, four currently present in the Macmillan Hall. I understand Councillor McCallan will be late today and we have the two Youth Council representatives here as well, Chloe Ellison and Finlay Anderson. Thank you. My approval to do re remote participation. Uh, again, welcome Chloe and, and, and Finlay uh, to the meeting. Hope they found it productive and hope there'll be contributions for you. Uh, so, is there any declaration of interest to be recorded? No interest. We'll move on then to item three, which is the minutes of the meeting of the 2nd of November for your noting. These have already been approved, I think, at the December meeting of the full council. There are just... Uh, rather than taking on any other business, there's three items here. Uh, there's the item under 4.4 .4 on the minute, uh, and that's the report on the Newton Stewart Protection Scheme. Again, a report on the Stronar Waterfront on, under paragraph 5.4 of the minutes, and again uh, on 7.4. And this is the information on respite that we asked for, and these are to be the subject for a further report on each of the three items. So if we just note those three and moving on. Move on to item four, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, a lot Here. A Sorry. Apologies. Katie. No, apologies, apologies, Chair. No, it's really challenging when you've got people online. It's just really to make a note on under item eight that there was also a request that an urgent meeting be arranged to discuss GP provision within the Wigton area. I appreciate that that's not for council officers to arrange because it is for the health board. I have just I have had some conversations myself directly, but that joint meeting hasn't yet been arranged as well. So just to ask that that gets added to the forward plan too. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Anyone else wanting in on the previous item? No? Can I move item four then? Yeah. Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. And we've got 
John Harvey and Tony Reid here to present and to highlight in your report. John, Tony. Uh, thanks, Wally. Uh, nothing to highlight in the report uh, other than we've got a wee change in sort of practice and policy coming in in July. It's to do with the unwanted fire alarm signals. Um, it's been on the horizon for the last couple of years probably, but it's coming into play in, in July. So there will be some changes to mobilisation of uh, fire appliances to uh, sort of commercial premises. Um, it's not going to affect uh, sort of sleeping risks, hotels, uh, care homes, hospitals, uh, places like that, but it will affect uh, sort of commercial premises. There's not going to be the same uh, mobilisation or predetermined attendance at these. Uh, so they will be looking for uh, a confirmed fire before they attend these these premises or incidents now. Thanks, Wally. You've got to work microphones to... <laughs> right. Now, as I say, there's a lot to commend in the, the, the report to the committee. It's open for your scrutiny. If there's any questions, uh, I'm sure John and Tony will try and answer the questions. So, reports before you. Hi, yeah, thank you, Willie, um, and thank you for the report. Lots of great stuff in it. Um, sorry. Can I just ask, on page 17, um, the road safety 3.6, it says we have continued to deliver targeted road safety education to schools throughout the region, utilising alternative delivery methods to ensure that current pupils do not miss out on this valuable engagement. Um, how is that delivered? Are you a part of that? And is it all primary schools in the West and secondary schools, please? Yeah, uh, if I can just bring uh, Tony Reid in at this point here. Uh, Tony's a uh, watch commander in uh, community safety and engagement, so he so organises and prioritises all these types of events so you can maybe give you a bit of feedback on, on what you're looking for there. Yeah, we've, we've already delivered <coughs> operation safety, uh, road safety uh, across the Friesen Galloway and we're also looking at doing an operation safety in, in May in Stair Park which is going to engage with primary six uh, upwards um, from C Vancouver Douglas this way so that will cover all the schools up here so operation safety runs east and operation safety is now running it didn't you? wasn't even put in place last year, I don't think. Um, but it's running this year in Stair Park, which will, it will be every school this this side of Castle Douglas up. Sorry, so will all of the primary sixes go over to Stair Park then with their yeah. skills? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, yeah. Okay, and that's already been arranged, so... It's in the process of being arranged. It's a partner agency. It's a multi-agency event. It's not just a fire service. Oh, lovely. That's yeah. fantastic to hear. Um, can I just compliment you once again on the youth work that you're doing? Um, when I was at the Youth Awards in Stranraer Academy, the improvement in the kids, just in their confidence, um, was phenomenal. So the work you're doing is, yeah. is fantastic. It's great. So once thanks, again, thanks, thanks for that. Thanks very much for that, yeah. Could I just mention a couple of other things that, uh, that's going on regarding road safety, and is that okay? Yeah. Uh, we've got a road safety overturning. event being held. It's a multi-agency road safety, a part of the DG uh, road safety, <coughs> and it's going on the 20th of April at the Cults Castle Kennedy. Which the, it's in conjunction with the, the Go-Kart Club uh, to target young drivers, and we're looking to build it up as a large event, and that will be replicated in, in the Dumfries side at a later time in the year. So... That's something that's been involved with the, the road safety. And that's got to be targeting young drivers, elderly drivers, and whatever. Um, obviously, a partnership with Nith Cree Driving, they're going to bring up Arctic lorries and it's involved in cyclists so they can see exactly what the drivers see when they're driving. So there's going to be a lot of good initiatives there and we're trying to build on it for this year and keep it going every year. So that's also happening on road safety. We've also got a road safety... Um, VR goggles, which we've now got in the area through the fire service, which can show um, virtual incidents where the, the kids can wear the goggles and be in the accident to try and show them what's involved. So that's going to be implemented shortly in the schools and right across the whole area once we get it all set up. So that's good. It's nearly good to go. So that's on the road safety. Hmm. Uh, 
Um, do you want me just to cover something on water safety when I'm on? Or do you want me to <laughs> carry on, Tony? Aye, you're on a roll. I'm on a roll. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, for the water safety, we've we've got a, a few different initiatives running. Um, we've got um, a water safety initiative through Post Scotland, which is part of the AG, part of that agency water safety group, and the uh, RNLI. And what we're doing is we're we're targeting every river and every water source in the area, mainly where there's been deaths or, or serious incidents. And we're providing the local businesses with a free throw line and a day's training. So we've got a few businesses down at, at the down in Newton Stewart at the minute who are going to be doing it in May. And that'll be a, f a full day's training. They get a free throw line for their business, and they'll be get an annual refresher from ourselves and the and the RNLI to keep them up to date with the skills. Uh, we're also looking at putting a, an access point at Clatterland Shaw's Dam for uh, require if, if the boat needs to be entered for a rescue in the water. That's been going on for a year with different partners now looking at the plan and how they get the slipway off the back of the lay-by up there. So that's hopefully getting getting done fairly soon, but it's been ongoing for a year. Um, and uh, <coughs> We've also got the Stenner event, which is coming up in, in May, hopefully, if, it, if the event goes back on. So that'll be on the ferries for four or five days, in, engaging with the, the motorcyclists, travelling on our roads, coming north and south of the border. So that's the update, update I can give you in that, eh? if there's any questions on that. Thanks, Tony. That's helpful and good to hear that you're proactive in some of those issues that, that are uh, pertinent to the, to the area. Is there anybody got any other questions? David? Thanks, Willie. <coughs> yeah, just to touch on the Clatham Shores issue, is it a planning issue that's holding that up? Or? Uh, I think it has to do with planning. Um, I couldn't be 100% sure. Uh, Watch Commander Stuart Derimple is working in conjunction with the partners up there, so um, what he's came back and said is, is uh, hoping that the launch site will be in place prior to in prior to Easter, Easter school holidays, and that's what I'm waiting at the minute, so I'm not sure on it, whether it's, it's just a, a dream, whatever, I'm not sure, but I could find out for you. Yeah. If I can come in, I, th I think it's to do with who actually owns a bit of land or intending to put the, the slip on, because I think the funding's in place for putting the slip in place, but I think us discrepancy over who actually owns that, that wee piece of land, so once I get that sorted, it, it, should, it should go ahead. Eh? Thank you. Yeah. Will that slipway be locked off to avoid anybody else putting boats into water there? Because I know they're not very keen on having. I'm boats sure it's for. I'm, I'm sure it would be access for emergency services only. Whether it be locked off with a barrier at this stage, I can answer that question. But I'd assume that it would be because there's no access for anybody getting to the water with boats. It's a referral emergency. Uh, due to the amount of paddle borders over the COVID time that they were up there. And, and so we're looking at being proactive and making sure we've got something in place. So I, I think that's, I'm sure it will be locked up. You just seldom see anybody on that bit of water and often wondered why, you know, because it looks such a an inviting bit of water for folk with canoes and stuff like that. Yeah, right, okay, so page 16, um, you report a drop in availability from the routine duty system, fire appliances and crews. I don't think there's any detail in here unless I've missed it. What, what is there much involved in that, or was it just an anomaly? Uh, pr primarily, the, the sort of the, the drop in availability was sort of coming out of the COVID situation. That, that there's a few personnel that's got other <coughs> primary employment, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, at the moment, uh, from a, a West point of view or Wickenshire point of view, uh, we've actually got a number of new applicants on at the moment. So our numbers in the stations will be very much improved in the next two or three months. So I, I expect availability to be uh, very good, actually, in Wickenshire. Yep. OK, well, that, that leads me on to page 34. The, uh, the employee profile. I see the gender balance is pretty skewed there, 89% male, 11% female. Is there an active approach to bring females into the fire service? Yeah, we certainly uh, run campaigns in the past regarding that. And, um, in Wickenshire, there is, there is a few uh, females that are working. And like I say, on the, the personnel coming into Wickenshire, there's a, there's a couple of females uh, coming into the, the service as well. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, 
if, if, if we need to, we can certainly run campaigns to, to, to assist with, with females joining the fire service. But I, I think right across, you'll see the numbers is increasing uh, all the time regarding females, all, albeit they're quite small, if you like, at the moment. Uh, but they're certainly, certainly increasing, yeah. Yeah, I think that was reflected in that night that they had on, on the awards, yeah. the youth awards, uh, and there was a number of young uh, females that were part of your team, Tony. So I think it is proactive, it is trying to encourage more. And I, I would hope that some of those young people would go on and find a career in the fire service. So uh, it's good to, to raise that point. Is there any other questions from anyone? Sorry, um, page 18, um, deliberate fire setting. Um, you, you've maybe already touched on this at the moment um, because it said it says down at the bottom that um, primary seven children were educated um, to mitigate antisocial behaviour and the delivery was at DG1 in Dumfries. Is that going to be rolled out in the east? Yes, yeah, so that was what uh, Tony was mentioning there. So the, right, okay, the so operation safety in, in the West, they, they were stopped during the, the COVID. Uh, so the freeze was the first to kick off again. Right. So operation safety will run in the West uh, this year at, at so Stair Park. So that, that covers all what you're that. looking That's for there. It's, it's a multi-agency event which covers sort of fire Police. safety, water safety, road safety. It covers, yeah. covers a whole lot. I kind of thought they'd maybe touched on it, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. Thank you. Any other questions? John, I've just got a couple, and I get, again, the A75, uh, and Tony's referred to it, and he's made uh, reference to, to, to bikes. Uh, on the. Uh, we know that there's a, a, an influx, a huge number of bikes used, the, the, the 75, but again, uh, it's referenced, and Tony's referenced it to the amount of work you're doing. Uh, and again, on page 20, 29, you know, we're low in Stranara and the Rins in terms of the number of accidents. But I've asked the same question. If you compare that against Annan, uh, Annandale North, in fact, yeah, that, that's a huge number. So we've got a number of trunk roads, uh, and it's really, uh, from the fire service point of view, what influence you have in terms of uh, trying to get improvements, given the number of accidents on the 75. You, you don't reference the 77, but the 75. Uh, you know, what input you have... <coughs> from a fire service perspe perspective in terms of the improvements to that road. Yep, so we do have, uh, we're a member of the Road Safety Partnership. Uh, so the Road Safety Partnership looks at all these these issues, uh, Willie, uh, and that's along with the, the police uh, and various other sort of agencies involved in that, right down to the, uh, the, the roads ins inspectors or themselves. So there is work getting done on that plus all the stuff that Tony's doing for an engagement or community engagement point of view. Um, you kind of mentioned about sort of highlighting certain areas uh, within the sort of data information that we've got. So we're actually moving to a new a new data system, which is a lot more up to date, which means we can, we can pretty much drill down into certain areas uh, and find exactly what the, the issues is. Uh, and then we can work with it more effectively. So that, that new system's in place. So we're just getting training on it at the moment just to, just to see how to use it. So once that's up and running, I, I, would, I would imagine our chances of identifying areas or how we can improve certain things will, will be highlighted much more effectively for us. Yep. The other question is that just on, uh, and you make reference to it, uh, the fire alarm systems, the number of checks you're doing that, that, that you're continuing that. Do you think you'll ever reach a point where you'll have them all done, uh, or whether it's your responsibility for, uh, to do this for the social landlords? Um, I, th I think Tony can maybe answer this better, but we're, we're still working with the, the sort of most at risk or the highest risk uh, uh, people in our area. And I would say the number of checks we're doing and the number of uh, rechecks that we're doing uh, continues the whole time. So we've certainly not taken our, our foot off the pedal there. Obviously, the new legislation coming in with the, the link detectors. So, uh, no, everybody is going to hear link detectors, and there is, uh, unfortunately, some people that, that, that didn't, uh, didn't get brought up or, or found out in the system. But we're continually finding new, 
new ways of getting into these these people's houses so we can put the, the, the systems in place, uh, whether that's through the police or social worker or, or whoever. But uh, as soon as these persons is identified to us, we are very quick at getting something in, in place for them. Yeah. No indication anyone wanting back in or wanting in on a question? Can I move to the recommendation? As I say, there's a lot to commend in this report. Uh, you know, in terms of Wigtonshire uh, uh, and how you're performing and achieving uh, well uh, above the, the, the Scottish uh, average and, and in front of many of other Scottish uh, fire services. So, we members are asked to scrutinise the performance report for Dumfries and Gallagher, which we have done, ask the questions in Scottish Fire and Rescue Service for the period April 22 to 30 September 22, the first part of the year. Uh, detailed in the appendices. Is that agreed? <laughs> Which is education, and we've got Karen Bryden, Bryden, Bryden and Alison Chambers with us to present the report. Thanks, John. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Anything, Karen or Alison, you want to highlight in your report? Again, it's the previous six-month report. Um, thank you, Chair. No, we've got nothing to highlight other than what's in the report there. Any questions on the report? Chrissy? Hi, thanks. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, page 38, um, 3.81. It says a number of schools in Wigtown area have signed up to, be digital, to the Digital Leaders Programme. I'm just wondering which skills these are, please. I don't have the detail of that with me today, but I could provide that for you. Yeah, okay, no, that would be great, thank you. Um, just with it saying a number, that's quite worrying for me that it's not all schools. So, um, yeah, that would be great if you could bring that back. Um, 3.82, um, I'd just like to commend Mrs. Bailey, um, the head teacher of the cluster partnership there, because she, she is continuously doing a fantastic job. And the fact that she got funding to take the primary five to primary seven children to Dumfries and Galloway College in Stranraer campus to embark on so many different activities during mass week was phenomenal. Um, my question on this is, um, because of this fantastic work, it sparked me to wonder why all primary schools did not undertake something under mass week um, and are not getting the same opportunities. So my question is, is this purely down to the fact that this head teacher is going above and beyond to um, put on these activities. Is there something that can be done, if that is the case, to encourage other head teachers in the whole of Wigtonshire so that all of our children are having the best start in life and are championing all of these activities so that when they go up to secondary school, they're all on the same pathway? Thanks. Thank you for that. I think it's very much about what we're reporting on. We're getting the best practice, but it's not to say that there's not good practice happening across uh, the area. So therefore, what we perhaps have captured is the best practice, but that's not to say the rest of the schools are not then taking forward other activities or similar activities within uh, Maths Week. So on that, did all schools embark on Maths Week? Do all of them take it up with it being Scottish Maths <coughs> Week, um, Maths Week across Scotland? Do all of the primary schools then have it in their curriculum for them to take something forward for Maths Week and likewise Science Week when it's on place. All schools have the opportunity to participate, but um, it, these decisions are taken at local level but at the discretion of the, the head teachers. And as uh, Alison referred, we, we've captured some of the good practice that's been shared with us and that's not to say it's not happening in other schools. Sorry, can I, um, um, on 38.3, the Douglas Ewart High School children um, have been going down to Whitholm, which is a fantastic, another fantastic thing going on in the region. Um, 
I spoke to the English teacher, Mr. Davies, who has, you know, been a, a massive part in this. And, you know, he was saying how well that the kids were engaging. I'm just wondering, do all the pupils um, have the opportunity? How are the pupils chosen? Is there sort of like, is it pupils that do a certain subject? Do, do we know any more information about that? Just wondering if everybody will get the chance to participate in, you know, the extracurricular stuff that's going on. Thanks. <laughs> So again, I think it's very much about we're coming out of COVID, we're coming into recovery, and it's about building that practice back up. So again, it's back to head teacher empowerment. They will make the decisions along with their teams. However, there will be more and more opportunities as years progress now that we're coming back out of that recovery period. Um, just it's such a fantastic experience, especially for a lot of children that are not necessarily academic, um, to learn extra skills because everybody has, you know, learns different ways. So no, that was fantastic. Um, I feel like I'm taking the show here if anybody else <laughs> wants to. <laughs> um, page 39, 3.9, priority two, providing the best start in life for all of our children. Um, I find it strange, as all schools don't seem to be getting the same opportunity of the wonderful things that are going on. Um, and I know this from speaking to different parents who will see things possibly in the media and say, oh, that school went and did this and that school went and did that. How come our school are not? So for us as counsellors, um, because we're being made aware that all schools don't offer these facilities and that, you know, the parents are a bit, you know, disencouraged <coughs> by this, um, how can we move forward to make sure that parents know their children, depending on what school they go to, are going to get these different opportunities, please? Can you clarify what you mean by different opportunities, please? The different opportunities, like we said before, I know you said it's down to head teacher level, um, but we're, we're looking again. And so it, it's sort of like when, when parents are coming to us and saying, well, our school don't do that, how can we then go back to them and say, it's down to he your head teacher, it's down to head teacher <coughs> level? You know, that's not the sort of answer that I want to be given to constituents. Is, is there something more that we can try and work on between us and the council or work on with the head teachers so that we can ensure whichever school that the children live in, the catchment area, they're going to be getting the same sort of like stuff? Thanks. I suppose what we would say to that is that there's a wealth and there's a breadth of opportunity that they're not all going to get the same opportunity at the same time. But through Curriculum for Excellence and through the senior phase, there should be that opportunity across their schooling experience that they will have similar opportunities, but they might not happen at the same time for the same young people or similar young people across schools. But it should be a continuum throughout their Curriculum for Excellence journey that they should have the same experiences because they're still working towards the different capacities within Curriculum for Excellence. Okay, thank you for that. Can I just ask on that one then, if they're not getting the same experiences at primary school, are we then extending the attainment gap or are we closing it? Because for me, it seems like we're not closing the attainment gap if the pupils are not getting the same experiences at the similar sort of age. So if primary seven children in one area, primary six, seven children are getting huge experiences that they can then take on to the high school, and there's some in different areas that are not getting those experiences, then the gap widens for the children that are not getting those experiences. So how are we getting it right for every child and how are we closing that attainment gap that we talk so much about in education, please? And I think, again, it's about that collaboration and sharing the best practice so that actually all schools are getting that sort of conversation to say, well, we've done this, it's worked well for us, so therefore, could we then take that best practice or good practice and then put that into another school? So again, I would say that there is definitely an emphasis around collaboration and working together and so that schools are not working in silos that we're understanding where we should be learning from one another so it's not about it's just saying well that's great because it works well in that school it's about why did that work well can we then replicate that in other schools because again it's it's a movable feast i think with education we're never standing still so therefore it's always about trying to find out what else can we be doing to give those young people that best start in life to make sure that we are making sure that our most vulnerable are actually getting an opportunity and when it comes to equity it's about well what how do we keep driving towards equity to ensure that every young person in the freeson galloway gets the opportunities that they really need to ensure that they then can contribute to their local economy going forward and as we referenced earlier, you know, now that we are moving out that recovery phase of COVID, there are more opportunities for that collaborative learning to take place face to face. I know only last week during Insight Opportunities, staff were then meeting and working alongside staff within and beyond their clusters now. So that's taking place now.
Sorry. Yeah, no, that's absolutely great. Just with us living out in the West and there not being as much that's opportunities. Great. Sorry? Um, no, that's fine, will I? I think it's fair to say that, uh, you know, different schools, we, we have given devolved uh, management and power to schools, and we would expect uh, if there's a good practice in one, that could be rolled out to others. It's not, as you have described, putting an eye, uh, eyes, uh, silo, uh, and it's only that, that school's doing it. So, so there is. I take the point in terms of your, what you're making in closing that attainment gap. And if it is good for one school, then let's hope another one can replicate uh, to what you're saying. Any other questions from any other member? Well, Richard? yes. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, it was just uh, page 39, 3.9.3, uh, in regard to exclusion rates. It, it starts off by stating that the exclusion rate in Wigtown has decreased, uh, which I fully understand. The next portion... It then states there's been a significant increase in the number of LAC exclusions falling to 40 per 1,000. I couldn't quite wrap my head around that. It doesn't seem to read correctly. Have I misunderstood that? I think it's, it's the terminology that's used to report exclusions. So although it's increased, the rate has fallen. So it's, it's almost becomes a negative and contradicts itself. Okay. <laughs> uh, and also, in addition to that, could just for me as a new councillor, could you further explain an LAC exclusion, please? So that's a looked after pupil, a, a pupil who's classed as officially classed as looked after. Okay. So needing additional support? No, no. That, that means that they are looked after either at home under supervision uh, order or through um, foster carers or perhaps okay. A, okay. a children's home. And also, in addition to that same point, um, it talks about the better relationships for better learning approach. Again, I'm sorry to ask, as a new councillor, could you further explain that approach and, and what's involved within that? Yep. So better relationships, better learning is approaches to understanding um, what we refer to as ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, trauma, all these factors that contribute to a young person's experience um, out with school and how that can impact within school. So uh, uh, going forward, we're launching what's known as a framework for inclusion where there will be training and more sharing of practice amongst uh, staff in schools about how best to support young people and children in those circumstances. I'm sorry. No, Why no. On the same point, please. Just... Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Apologies. On the same point, mm -hmm. um, could you further explain, just for me again, it, it mentions the policies and procedures that are in place for monitoring. Could you go slightly further and explain what those? policies and procedures are? I can indeed. Those, poli you. those procedures um, have been reviewed in the last six months or so and there was an event in September where it was launched now that any school considering an exclusion of a looked after pupil, that exclusion has to be discussed through the central management team in education now. So either with Jim or somebody of that level. Okay, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, <coughs> on that exclusion then, not looked after children, but just general exclusions. I know schools have a policy that, you know, no exclusions if we can avoid it. However, there comes a point where it's inevitable and the report and procedure, am I right in saying, comes through the head teacher. It's the head teacher that, that brings that forward and it's her responsibility to ensure the school does not exclude if she can avoid it. Is that correct? <laughs> So in terms of exclusions, you're right. It's um, it's not no exclusions, but it's really that is the last resort. So have we exhausted everything else before we've gone to that point of excluding? But there is cases where exclusions will happen, and that's for the for the reasons to try and get a plan in place for that young person. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think <coughs> yeah, I, I've touched on on exclusion yeah, before with the director, and. It comes from a, a history of disruption within schools that you sometimes think we're getting it right for one and not for the other 99 pupils out of 100. You know, it just... So, if it's down the head teacher, 
it's how that's monitored, how those reports go through and are actually finding where they need to go to ensure that we're getting the right statistics in these reports. And I don't know whether that's something that needs to be addressed in the future. I didn't know if it was a question or whether, or whether it was a statement. That's why I was going to say, I don't know whether... So, in terms of, is it something that needs to be addressed? Is something that's never off the table? So, when we're looking at exclusions, it's because we report on exclusions, we get reports on exclusions, so therefore it's always a conversation that's happening within the central team as well as at school level. So, it's not as if that is the policy in place, so therefore it's going to be ever more. It's always looking about how are we using that information to then shape our understanding because there's always new data coming through, there's always new policies coming through, there's always new learning coming through in terms of that professional learning about understanding that young person or child. So therefore, I would say that it's never standing still. We do look at our data, we try to interpret that data, we try to be informed about how we do that, but we're never sort of saying, well, that's our, that's our da data and that's it. Come back just a second. I think, you know, the point, what we're getting as councillors is real concern from parents within schools. And here, and any meetings we have with the director or in education, is where it needs to come up. Question or no question, we need to flag this up. The issues that the schools are facing, not only from the point of view of the staff that are dealing with a challenging behaviour of children who are getting spat on, kicked, punched, you know, within the school, uh, but also the disruption to classrooms and the disruption within the whole school in some instances. Uh, I think that's something that, as elected members, we need to bring to the table and education needs to look at it and, and try and decide how they're going to deal with that, because I don't think at the present moment in time that's being dealt with. So my question probably is, is that something that you're looking at in the long term to get it right for the 99% of kids that are in schools and not just the 1% of children who do need that extra support? Without being too quick, quirky about it, we're trying to get right for all young people in Dupuis and Galloway, not 99, not 1%, and that's why we're always striving towards that, getting it right for every young person. I think the report's starting to look at that and, and, and seeing the reduction, but it doesn't mean to say that we've got it right uh, currently. Uh, and I've made this point, I often wonder about the reports and whether they should be better or, or more specific. My question would be, have we got the proper resources? I know at one time we had Abba Lower, but we're talking now about going down into primaries and, and sometimes even into to, to nurseries where we, you know a child can show uh, challenging behaviour. So, so, you know, have we got the resources? If, if it's in secondary and exclusions being considered, we don't have a, a, another secondary school other than 25 miles away from if, if we're taking Wigtonshire. Uh, uh, in isolation, uh, so it's no like you know we can say right you'll be educated here. As I say, we used to have have a lower that we could refer uh, kids to. We no longer have that. We've got better lives that tend to deal in adults from 16 onward. Uh, so you know, in, in the question, have we got it? It may be something. I don't expect the answer because uh, that question, but it may be something that we can come to in the, the recommendations uh, as to what you're looking for in the report. Any other questions from members? Yeah. <coughs> yes. Finley? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I've just got a quick question because obviously in this item a big theme has been communication between whether that's between schools and staff and what makes good practice. What My question would be though, what are the current ways that head teachers or staff can share their good practice? Is there a current platform that they can do that? And is it, oh, sorry, is it effective? So in terms of how that collaboration works, there's different layers to it. So there's in-school collaboration in terms of through departments, through working time agreements, so they're having those meetings throughout the calendar of the year. There's also collaboration in terms of school collaborative reviews when we have people from the central team as well as other head teachers going around schools to sort of look at how the, how the school is 
performing at that period of time, as well as that we have collaboration across head teachers. So we have, again, we have families of head teachers that meet together to, again, look at points of challenge. In addition to that, we're part of a regional collaborative, and so therefore we have collaboration with our partners in the Ayrshire as well. So there's an awful lot of different levels and layers of collaboration. Um, and I think your second point was, is it effective? We do have a standards and quality every year where we are looking about what has worked, what's not has worked, and then how do we improve it. So it's that evolving picture of is it effective practice. And just to add, in addition to that, there is a responsibility for every teacher each year to take on um, 35 hours of professional learning of their own as well to go out and seek that. And that can be uh, local authority based, it can be national. So <coughs> there's all these opportunities for staff to take part in. Yes, thank you. Willie, good. So thank you, Chair. J just a question um, relating to the report itself. Uh, on page 44, um, obviously I, I know that, that some of the KPIs are not measured in six-month periods, <laughs> but just to, to help with assessing the data in front of you, I felt it would be helpful to, to input the, you know, the, the previous year's data or the previous six months to show you can compare you know, the, the two things if you, you, you showed and displayed the, the, the data for those half years that were missing. Because at the moment, say, for example, the percentage of pupils gaining a five-plus award, it just says not measured, not measured. There's nothing to really look at to compare. Well, yes, it, it may be helpful to, to show those six-month periods where data was attained, just so you could make a, a proper comparison. Thank you. We've noted that for action. Thank you. Thanks, Chair, and apologies for, for lateness. Um, obviously, I don't know what's been covered here, so if it's all ground, just tell me. Um, it's on page 39, 3.9.2. Just a bit of clarification, please. I don't know, am I speaking in there? Um, so when we say that the attendance rates for Wigton areas be, continues to be impacted by COVID-19, are we talking w w impacted how? So is it, do they ha is our children having, ha needing to stay off because of they've got COVID or um, is it the impact as a, you know, as of the two years or cause it, that there could mean a whole wealth, a range of things and, and it's just a bit vague for me, thanks. Um, for us, it's th those young people who find coming into school still challenging as a result of the extended periods of closure after COVID. Can I come back in, Chair? Um, yeah, so briefly, what work's being done to, to encourage them back to school? I think it's fair to say that attendance is a priority ac across all our schools. There's monitoring of attendance at a school level. Um, Head teachers get in touch with families um, when concerns are starting to be flagged regarding attendance. There is a, a standard letter that is sent out to families when pupils get to a certain uh, rate of attendance, that's 85%. In addition to that, as an authority, we have an attendance team, attendance support officers, and schools can refer pupils to that service and then the attendance officers would engage with the families to work to try and increase the attendance in school. Just very briefly, um, Chair. So, so all that said, I mean, that I, I'm assuming that that approach can be taken for any child that's got any reason for not coming back to school. So, how do we identify that it's a COVID-related um, child that's not coming back? Shall we say that that would be local-based knowledge that the head teacher or the senior, leader, senior leadership of the school would have been engaging with the families. Yeah, it's very unusual for head teachers to wait till it gets to the 85% yeah. before they start engaging with families. Right. I don't see anyone else want to come in. Can we move to the recommendations uh, before we do, you know, just on 3.9.3, I think the language is confusing in that one if we could try, you know, I don't know if it's up doing where it is, so maybe we could look at that in, in the future in terms of, of reporting. And I think Chrissy did go on, I was quite liberal in terms of, you know, uh, allowing people to speak and when they could speak uh, without trying to cut anyone off. 
uh, but there are 15 uh, illustrations here, but there's a lot more going on in our schools that, that uh, are to be commended in terms of our projects. We've seen 15 here, but there's many more. So just looking at the recommendations in terms of scrutinising, we've scrutinised the 2-1 review of the six-month uh, summary of performance for Wigton, and there's a lot to be commended again in the report from April 22 to September 22, set in uh, paragraphs 378 uh, uh, in the appendixes. Uh, agreed? 2.2, uh, consider the area-based achievements and development as detailed in the key achievement section uh, of this report in paragraphs 3.8 to 3.13.3. Are we sure we've got the number? I, I don't think there is a 1.3.3. It's 1.3.2, is it not? Again, just it's me being pedantic there. Okay, it's a, agreed? And again, consider any aspect of performance to be referred to the relevant future committees. There was a number of issues there. There was the exclusion. That's the attainment in terms of closing the attainment gap in, in some of the projects. Uh, I don't know if you would want these referred back to education for consideration in terms of how we do roll out good practice to, to make sure the risk, uh, that uh, performance and collaboration be, uh, between schools. And then there's the attendance issue that, that you refer. I don't know if you want these referred back to education for consideration <coughs> on the three aspects. It's how we report and make it more uh, pertinent to, to, to each of the areas. Is that okay? Are those three areas to be reported back? Any other issue then? Is that agreed? Move on to item six. Can I just thank you for your time? Thank you for having us this morning. Yeah, um, thanks. Apologies. <laughs> I hope you... That's always something, isn't it? <laughs> Item six, and we've got Ingrid on remote. Uh, Ingrid, anything to highlight in your report? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, nothing further to add to the report at this point. Thank you. It's open to members for questions. If there are no questions, can we move to the recommendations? Sorry, Willie. Can I just ask, on page 48, 3.10, it says awards of £10,000 or more had a, a lead officer. Who is this lead officer, please? It just says lead officer. It's the lead... Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so the lead officer um, for that one organisation is myself. So at 3.4, it says, in addition, Wigton Area Committee had 2,700 remaining um, from its budget, which was carried over. I was just checking that that was the 62,604, and if anybody's putting in for grants, when when is that open? For the Is that for the discretionary grants for people to apply to? So, like, for community groups and stuff, just for clarification on that one, um, and does that have, like, a time period over it, or can people apply to it at any time, please? So, the the figures that you referred to there are the what was in the, what was in the this is a monitoring report for what ha what happened um, in the previous year. So, there is there was £59,904 that, that was allocated to Wigton Area Committee and then there was the 2700 that was left from the year before that members agreed that they would carry forward given that total budget of 62604 And what this report does is, is basically um, provides the monitoring information on how that money was spent and which groups benefited from it. 
Thank you. Any questions from other members? I think you'll see here that, that just to the point that Chris is making, there was a, a, a carryover last year of 2,000 uh, and odds, and, and this year there's a, a, a 1,000, which is in 2.3. Uh, Ingrid, I've just got a, a couple uh, or a question in terms of the, the monitor and report. There are some that are not have not uh, submitted a report. Uh, uh, w what's the, your, your practice in? Uh, following those up, do we get those reports? Yes, yeah, so there is some of those organisations have had the money just at the back end of the year, so their projects haven't actually happened yet. So there's some that's happening in kind of February, March period of time. So they'll provide the monitor once those those projects have been, have been completed. And there is one or two where we, we already have asked them for monitor and information and we're chasing that up again just because we haven't received it. Okay. Again, in the report, we, we've dispersed us some £60,000 to, to, to so many recipients, community groups throughout the third sector organisations. So I think uh, we've done well again. The point, Chrissy, as soon as we can make it available, we know what the budgets are now. Uh, as soon as that's made available, we've got to make it available to the groups. Uh, and if we could do that as quickly as possible. Uh, can we turn to the recommendations? Uh, two, one, note the performance monitor information from projects, initiatives that receive support from Wigdon Area Committee, discretionary budget detailed in the appendix. Is that agreed? I'm happy with that. Two, two, note that the significant number of citizens have benefited from the delivery of 49 local projects, uh, initiatives, and over £60,000 has been invested in the projects, initiatives in the local Wigdon area. And you can see them in there in uh, what benefits and good we've done within the community. Is that agreed? Yeah. And two, three, agree uh, to carry forward the remaining balance of, of this year, 2022-23 discretionary budget to the 23-24 budget as detailed in paragraph 3.12. Is that agreed? Yep, moving, moving to item seven, which again is the Stranoir Common Good, and it's just here for, uh, again, your approval. Happy to approve the minutes, Chair. Is that agreed? Thank you. I have no other business then, and just thank you for your attendance. Thank you. And as I said earlier, I, I will be formally resigning from today. Uh, and again, thank the officers as normal. Uh, they're always here to help us. And I hope you find that when you have any questions. And uh, in terms of the deliberation, uh, we've always uh, well advised. So thanks very much for all the efforts you put in. So again, it's down to yourselves. <laughs> thank you.